All right, can I have everybody's attention? I uh, want to introduce our speaker for today. And, um, uh, you know, you saw the abstract. Uh, this is uh, Terry Fu. He's an alumni of the uh, UHCL physics program. He actually, uh, he's one of these people who started off by, uh, you know, coming to a few talks here on campus, and then he took one or two classes, and then uh, a few more classes. And then after a while, he said, um, uh, I need to apply for admission because I'm getting ready to graduate soon. And so then after that, he was actually one of the first students to go through our collaborative PhD program with UH. And he's currently working on his um, PhD uh, thesis, uh, which will be awarded hopefully within the next um, you know, year, two years, somewhere in there. <laughs> hopefully a year. Yeah, and he's working uh, with Dr. Shevlin, who talked last week, and uh, he's going to be talking about eigenanalysis of an ideal uh, Hall MHD, which is sort of related work to what you heard last week. So with that, I'll turn it over to Terry. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, uh, what, what I plan to talk about today is uh, Hall MHD turbulence, and ideal means you have uh, no dissipation or, or uh, you know, resistive losses. So, you know, here's, here's a nice little screenshot of the Crab Nebula. Uh, basically, any astrophysical property has turbulence involved. Uh, so, you know, and we'll, we'll get to that. What I'm going to talk about is essentially a mathematical physics model of uh, all MHD turbulence. And uh, the eigen analysis part means it's a simplifying process which you can break a system down into its most fundamental modes. And I'll bring up an example of that that does simplify things when you try to picture them. So uh, let's start with basic turbulence first before we move on into MHD turbulence. It goes all the way back historically to, you know, to the Renaissance. Vinci was one of the first people to actually scientifically study it. And in this little sketch, he's basically comparing water turbulence to, say, hair blowing in the wind. That vortices and steady currents and, you know, all the complicated swirling and interaction. So, so anyway, that, that's basically fluid turbulence or fluid mechanics. The turbulence is fluid mechanics. And uh, so moving on, when when we couple uh, fluid mechanics with electromagnetism, we uh, we have what's called NHD magneto hydrodynamics. And uh, for a turbulent state of MHD, we can basically think of the fluid or plasma as the dynamical interaction of hydrodynamic forces and uh, magnetic forces. And magnetic primarily because the plasma assumption assumes that the fluid is basically electrically neutral. So we don't have to worry about that's not to say there aren't electric fields, but we don't have to worry about electric forces on large scale, on the large scale. So now the uh, the main assumption of MHD is basically the fluid model. So you know what that says is it doesn't make a distinction between you know negative charge electrons going this way versus positive charge basically going the other way. It's all equivalent. It kind of blends the overall electrons and ions together as a single fluid. And the way that assumption works is because we're assuming that the ions are fixed, massively, infinitely uh, motionless particles, you know, that don't move. So what that means is the electrons, the frequency of the plasma can react fast Know, to the for the electrons to move about instantly, and uh, you know that that is basically saying that the, the 
fluid or plasma frequency that we typically much larger than the ion and cyclotron, the ion and electron frequency, which are proportional to any, elect any uh, magnetic field in the plasma. And, um, you know, since the electron is 2,000 times roughly smaller than the ion, basically we say that the ion frequency is going to be typically the criteria for which there are the characteristic fluid to use. Now, for Hall MHD, what that does is now we're no longer uh, saying that it's a single fluid particle, but we are actually considering the ions as being movable with a finite mass. So what you do there is you assume that the characteristic plasma frequency isn't necessarily so large anymore, at least compared to the uh, ion cyclotron frequency. And uh, what you see here is a typical, this H is what's called the uh, Hall parameter, and it just goes as the ratio of the typical fluid frequency to the ion cyclotron frequency. And for the uh, solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere, which I'll show a picture after this, the typical values is solar wind is typically 500 kilometers per second, it's pretty fast. The, uh, the field that's, you know, out there at the outskirts of the uh, Earth interacting with the wind is pretty small, five times 10 and a negative nine Tesla. But when you put all the numbers together, you get a, oh, and the, and the length, you know, basically let's say the size of the order of the size of the Earth or a little bit bigger, so 10,000 kilometers. And so when you put all the numbers in, you get a, a number at 0.1, which is pretty small, but I wouldn't call that and just ignore it completely. So that's the difference. MHD would assume that this ratio is essentially zero, but all of MHD, you know, includes its effect. And uh, so for the mathematical model I'll be discussing, it will be essentially ideal homogeneous Hall MHD. So what goes into all those assumptions is you assume the fluid is incompressible, which is, you know, a pretty good assumption for a lot of physical fluids. Homogeneous means that, you know, it's, it's a very large scale. Any, what's happening in one spot is pretty much the same as any other spot. And uh, the ideal part means that we're not, again, we're saying that we things like energy and momentum and so other physical invariants that are going to be sort of when we don't have any energy loss and some viscosity or uh, electrical resistance. And uh, all these assumptions will lead to some mathematical techniques which we can do to analyze the system. There will be Fourier, Fourier analysis, uh, there will be we can look at the statistical mo statistical mechanics of the system, and the eigen analysis, as I mentioned earlier, is related to uh, looking at the system from a normal mode approach. And here is a nice little picture of uh, the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere. And certainly, uh, you know, right here at the boundary, there's a lot of dynamics going on, and you could say that that is uh, a turbulent system, for sure, a non highly, highly nonlinear and turbulent. And so if you have any questions, you know, just inter you, know, you can interrupt on, on the spot, you know, it's always easier to remember what you want on the spot. And there will be, I have to warn you, there will be some more technical slides coming up, so that might be a, if you need a break, a good spot to uh, to ask something. Okay. All right, so what we have here are the uh, all MHD equations. We should. The, uh, the key things to know about this the first equation is the Navier Stokes equation, uh, which is the fundamental equation of fluid mechanics. Hopefully, you've seen that. The second one is the equation that relates to how the internal magnetic field 
changes the The main the main uh, variables are the U is the fluid velocity, omega is the fluid vorticity, basically the curl velocity. And, you know, vorticity is really the simplest way for the to analyze the system. That's why it's expressed as J is the current density for the magnetic field. And uh, these two conditions here are what's called solenoidal conditions. This one, the divergence of the magnetic field is always here. And basically, there's no magnetic monopoles. And this one here follows from the incompressible assumption of the field. It's equivalent. And uh, some other, here's the Hall ratio here. So if this went to zero, then you wouldn't have this term. You would have the standard MHD equation. Uh, and some other, everything here are lowercase letters. What that means is that the volume average of the quantity is zero. It doesn't, you know, it means in, at any small isolated position you can have a fluctuating quantity, but on average, the little lowercase variables are zero. And you can do that with the with the uh, fluid velocity as you move it to its center of mass strain. And now what we have here is it cannot necessarily do that with a magnetic field because you know if the system has an overall average magnetic field, you can't just build a system where it where it's secure. So, and these are the resistive terms. This one is due to uh, viscosity, and this one is due to resistivity. These are basically the loss terms. And another thing is these equations have been non-dimensionalized. To really solve them, you want to do it, put it on a computer, and you want just pure numbers to work with. And basically, you can non-dimensionalize them by Essentially, equating the fluid velocity equal, or you know, on the same magnitude of the magnetic field by basically expressing everything in terms of Alpine velocity. Alpine velocity is proportional to magnetic field. Oh, and sub bottom note is when. The viscosity and resistivity go to zero. We have basically ideal turbulence. These left terms go to zero. And it's turbulent in the sense of when you properly non dimensionalize these equations, you'll see that the viscosity term is one inversely proportional to the Reynolds number and the the resistivity is proportional to inversely proportional to a magnetic So highly turbulent system where those numbers go to infinity, you should get these going to zero. Some other things. These so when these are zero, these U cross omega, J cross B, and U cross B are the three distinct terms, and those are basically your driving force terms. And they're also the, the nonlinear terms that go into these uh, sets of equations. So, you know, it's complicated, but yeah, that's basically where you have to start from, from the base fundamental equations. Okay, let's go on to what's meant by homogeneous turbulence. So here's a picture of basically the sun, you know, and all the turbulence, and all the stuff that's going on inside. So the sun being such a large object, if you home in on not necess not necessarily too small of an area or too big of an area, but just you know, kind of the medium size area of the sun, it's going to look pretty much the same there as anywhere else. So that's an example of uh, homogeneous, homogeneity. So what, what that is also equivalent to is if any one box 
equivalent to any other box. It's a periodic position. And once you assume a periodicity, that's when you can start bringing in Fourier analysis. Those are expansions on periodic signs and boson functions. This is where it starts getting a little technical, but uh, I'll, I won't try to go over every single little detail. But the main point to take out of this is the original partial differential equations, you can transform them, if we're assuming this homogeneous approximation, to the original functions, you can transform them to uh, a bi a uh, four of its three four a transform into sums over over essentially k space. So the original x space functions are now k where k is just some integer that goes from starting from one, okay, that's the first distinct integer, up to some maximum value of k, which is essentially determined you can determine that basically by the size of your system and you have to set a maximum value because if any of you have ever done 4A or spectral analysis, you don't want to go too high of a frequency, otherwise you start, uh, when you get too high, you start going back to your original low frequency, so you got to cut it off at some point. It's called the aliens. Uh, so anyway, you can go back and forth between the two representations. And uh, the solenoidal conditions in case space is actually simple. Basically anywhere, because we're summing over, well, sines and cosines, but combine them as uh, exponential arguments. Basically anywhere that you see the, curl, the Dow operator, either as a curl or as a, as a, or as a divergence, like the I can't have questions. Uh, I'm sorry, you were, you were talking about not wanting to venture off into <clears throat> higher frequencies. Is that just because of the higher order harmonics of the lower frequency and you're just going to end up getting the same result as you were looking at your lower frequencies? Or is there... Yeah, you, you you always run into that. Well, there, there's kind of two reasons, but I mean, yeah, the first one is anytime you model a system on, on you know, a finite system or finite resolution, you just can't go to an arbitrarily high frequency. Otherwise, you'll find that you'll start repeating. You know, you'll start going back to the you know, higher harmonics will start matching your lower harmonics. And that's just on the finite system. And also, there's kind of another reason. You also, and I'm glad you brought that up because you just made me forget that the original space was actually a cube that has a length too high each y and z direction. And the k space has actually it is it does actually map from q to q, but because you have to set a limit, you've actually kind of chopped the corners off the cube and uh, made it into uh, a sphere. So you also set you set this condition for the maximum k is also a thing that is do an yeah. All right, so anyway, when you make the transformations into the original partial difference equation, you'll actually you'll actually simplify uh, a nonlinear partial differential set of equations into ordinary differential equations. Okay. Those are a lot easier to solve. Unfortunately, they'll be a little messier because you've made every single individual function into a sum over a whole bunch of k functions, but you know which are also coupled to each other. But the key is that it's been uh, simplified into a set of ordinary, ordinary different equations. Now, for as I mentioned, for the ideal system, we're going to have some conserved quantities. I mean, certainly energy will be conserved, which is just the sum of uh, kinetic energy plus magnetic, you know, basically magnetic pressure is 50 squared. 
Uh, and one thing is, once you've done this Fourier transformation, it's really a sum over distinct modes. Think of this as uh, each of the K modes as, uh, as you know, an ideal gap. So all of these modes are interacting with each other as, as an ideal gas. And just as you know with ideal gases, you have you know, conserved things like temperature or equivalent to energy. It turns out for MHC, for Hall MHC, you get some uh, more interesting dynamics. You also get what's called uh, generalized solidity and magnetic solidity conserved. And these are their definitions. I won't go into that in more detail. Uh, but this Hall ratio, Hall parameter term, if you let that go to zero, you would only get this first term, which is called the clock solidity in MHD. And that's useful because MHD work has been done, and but this analysis is always nice to fall back on what's known by setting a parameter to zero. And the magnetic solidity is basically defined as vector potential rather than the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, as I said, the modes in this Fourier transformation act are interacting hydrogen atom molecules. And, uh, and when you actually look at the detailed form of the equation, even though they're highly coupled, no one mode actually has a dynamics dependent on that mode, it just depends on all the other modes. So what that implies is that all the modes acting together will kind of satisfy a conservative uh, theorem from Louisville that says that you, if you track all of the coefficients and think of them as interacting gas modes, you form a flow, a swarm of particles that when you actually move with them, the density of those particles and and also the volume will actually stay conserved as you move them. And that's the basis of the real theorem. And that leads to basically defining a statistical mass mechanics that depends on these two variants. You know, and for I see you know, for some of you that are taking these classes, hopefully these terms are kinda reminding you. Uh, you know, and, and so, the, and that's also the point of this, this, when you get into your research, you'll find that you actually do use all these things that, that you think that you're forced to have to take right now. So <laughs> hopefully, you know, you'll get there. Okay. So before I move on into the, a little more detail about the Paul and HD theory, I'll just give you an example of but why eigen analysis is useful. This example comes from hopefully, you know, you've seen a pop like this in your mechanics course. It's uh, basically we have uh, three different masses. The central one, you know, has one mass and the other two have another mass. They're coupled by identical spring constant K. Uh, don't be confused this K with the K I had with Fourier. This K is not, you know, it's spring constant. It's not necessarily an energy. And uh, this sort of thing, you know, could be used to model uh, or water models. Uh, and one thing is they're all constrained to move just in along the line. So we, we're not considering rotation or anything. So they're, you know, we, you can get the normal modes from the analysis of the equation, but you know, if, or if you have good intuition to begin with, you can kind of see that there are only three fundamentally different ways that you can uh, move about this system, at least in a line. The first is you, you either pluck or compress the central two masses, and so that the center one stays stationary while the other two are oscillating about. The second mode is displacing the center mass one way, and then displacing the other two outer masses the other way. The third, and maybe the 
trivial, but it does pop up is all three of them can just move in a station, in a, in a line. Now the first two have their center of mass saying, you know, six, whereas the third one has it moving at a constant velocity. All right, so when you look at this system and write out the fundamental equation, which is, this is basically the spring equation, a simple harmonic oscillator equation, and you can get this by either analyzing every every mass using Newton's law, or there's there other ways to find a Lagrangian and apply Lagrangian equations. But when you do it, and what I've done is, you know, as a vector, the, uh, the fundamental vector is just x1, 2, and 3, and these normalize by the square root, or not normalized, but times of the factor of square root of each mass. And the reason I did that was because it'll make the coupling matrix nice and symmetric. Okay. So this M is, it's a, if you look at it, obviously symmetric, and it's called the covariance matrix. And what it does is it relates all the X1, you know, X1, 2, and 3. You have three sets of equations here. Now, you can simplify that, since it's the original system of coupled, you can kind of uncouple them by essentially diagonalizing the matrix. And you can do that, you know, from your mass method, the way you do that with a symmetric matrix is if you take an orthogonal matrix to apply this orthogonal transformation. Orthogonal means that the transpose of, of itself is equal to the inverse of the matrix. And when you apply that transformation, you'll turn, you know, this into a pure diagonal matrix with just three, three, three uh, frequencies or eigenvalues along the diagonal, which are given by these are the eigenvalues, which actually correspond to the square of the normal frequency. K over U is obviously the frequency of the first mode. Then second mode has the sum of K over U plus twice. So basically, you get this. This contribution is from the center mass bouncing back and forth. Of course, zero, which means that there is no vibration. It's just moving all along as a single system. But the key to this is that so this coupled set of equations becomes nice, pure. Know, diagonalized uh, equations in terms of each of the individual what are called components of an eigenvector. So each of the components of this V corresponds to the components of those, those different normal modes. And eigenvalues of this covariance matrix correspond, the square root of them corresponds to the normal frequencies. So knowing that, now we apply the same analysis to the statistical mechanics I mentioned for this, for the Hall MHD system. Uh, as I said, Louisville's theorem implies that there's a constant density function. And it's got to be constant. That basically means it has to be a function of the invariance. So that's, you know, how you express the density function as as basically a linear combination of the three invariants here. And these constants will be determined later. They're basically equivalent to temperatures or inverse temperatures. This, this is, except, you know, this is essentially a maxwell Boltzmann type of distribution. And once we've defined a distribution function, we can take measure any physically determined quantity by taking an average of the distribution function. So that's what's called an ergodicity assumption, meaning that anything, any observable is, is equivalent to taking an ensemble average, which is equivalent to a time average. So, you know, that's an ergodicity assumption. All right, so, 
this overall density function, since now we're talking about all these interacting modes, you can break up, break it up as a product. And you know, for each mode, we can define a, a modal density function. And the Z factor is a normalizing factor called the partition function, which you know, the statistical mechanics is important. But you know that you can determine virtually any property you want in the partition function. And it turns out that you know the definitions of all the energy and the helicities in terms of the fundamental variables, just like with the spring system, it turns out they're highly they're coupled together by this covariance matrix. Now, because we've moved to a Fourier space and you know, we have to deal with complex quantities now, but this covariance, this covariance matrix is if you look at it, it's Hermitian. What that means is that you know each corresponding transpose element is a complex conjugate across from each other. So except for here where these are we're real. Okay. And it's similar mathematics, instead of an orthogonal transformation, now you're dealing with a unitary transformation and you can diagonalize the system just as before. We had a couple of sets, now you can break it up into nice pure you know, diagonal form. And this will be a four fundamental eigenvariables. We had originally had four fundamental uh, velocity and magnetic field components. And we'll also get four fundamental eigenvalues associated with each particular table. So for the real and imaginary part? Oh, well, technically eight. I didn't want to. You get, uh, I'll go back up. So originally you had three components since we're talking about three dimensions, but this solenoidal constraint or condition makes really because you have to satisfy that allows you to boil it down to just two components for each. And because we moved to a Fourier phase, each component has actually got a real and imaginary part. So it's a total of four independent components for the velocity and four for the magnetic field giving you a total of up to eight. And that's primarily why you're dealing with a four by four imaginary. If you wanted to work with the eight fundamental, you could do an eight by real eight, eight by eight real symmetric matrix, but yeah, this is already bad enough, so stick with four by four. example this this is all just a lot of equations but you know bottom line is you've actually taken the original set of couple of equations that depended on four fundamental variables e1 to e1 c2 broken them up into fundamental eigenvariables to which each one has a corresponding eigenvalue and you know, because these are just def definitions involving all the parameters, because the actual expressions are fairly long. But if you look at the, each of these eigenvalues, basically will depend on here's alpha, and these two functions will depend on beta, gamma, and the Hall ratio, and also on whatever k you're in. And the same with the eigenvariables. But the main thing to get out of it is once you've diagonalized everything, it turns out to be just you know simple Gaussian type distribution function, which I mean you know if you work with those, it, that they fundamentally have so they're zero zero mean random variables each of the fundamental eigenvariables, but they're magnitude squared, or you can think of it as a variance. 
is basically when you work it out is inversely proportional to each of the eigenvariables. So what that says is that you know, well, there will, out of all the modes, be a mode that has the very smallest value. And that's the important one because then this goes as the energy since it's uh, quantity squared. The mode with the smallest eigenvalue that has most of the energy in it. And again, when you let the Hall ratio go to zero, then these do, I have checked them, they do match the, the actual Hall MHD results. Of the MHD known result. Okay. You know, so once you, we, the whole reason of this diagnosisation procedure, like an analysis, it, it actually makes the evaluation of the partition function, which I said is, you know, high, really important. That's the thing that lets you determine all the statistical mechanics features. It makes it pretty simple to evaluate. As I said, there are eight fundamental independent components, you know, real and imaginary components of each type of variable. And the partition function is just the end Defined as the integral of that over, you know, the Boltzmann, the Boltzmann factor. So, you know, that's what it works out to. Basically, from each one of the eight, you get a factor of the square root of pi over, over the square root of lambda. Since there are eight of them, you get, you multiply together, you can get this. And from those exp expressions on a previous page, so yeah, I can, when you multiply all four of these together, you'll get this for your modal partition function. And once you know that, you can actually use that to compute the various expectation values to known quantities that you want to compare to. And those known quantities, you know, are essentially their variance, which, you know, you, you actually choose what they are because you have to when you set up a system. You have to pick some initial conditions. And since these are invariant, whatever your initial conditions are, you know, for each of these will be what these should stay during the entire run of the system or an ideal system. Uh, okay, but to actually get the partition function, we actually have to get these inverse temperature parameters. And when they, these can be related to your Variance or your constants here. You know, uh, these, or it'll turn out that your inverse temperature is a function of the constant, and there are going to be two other independent parameters, which for the MHD case, these parameters will basically reduce to one, which turns out to be the uh, expectation of the magnetic, the average of the magnetic energy, but not necessarily in the case of MH, tall MHD. Here is the expression. Okay. Let's just take my word for it. That's what you get. Okay. And you know, notice the, they look complicated, but I threw them up there to show you that each of these unknown constants is just a function of the two parameters, phi one and phi two. The other stuff, those are your initial conditions, which you know you specify, so those are known. And this R it's just a geometric factor. It turns out to be the ratio of the total independent K mode they have, you know, to basically the total size of the system, the number of rate points. I haven't, when you actually solve this numerically, you have to break your system into, uh, you know, like, uh, for example, a 32 cubed rate point system. So, and at least for standard or I would say medium resolution system would be supposed to do some power of two. So this is another physical feature as to how the whole point is to determine 
what uh, your inverse temperatures are, and you can do that from determining what the unknown parameters phi 1 and phi 2 are. It turns out that there's a, a uh, it's called an entropy function, which will have a minimum, and that has to be, that minimum will actually define the entropy of the system. And for an ideal system, when it reaches equilibrium, so it has to get there. We'll have to have a defined entropy. And so basically, when you minimize this, this so called functional expansion over all these quantities, whatever values of phi 1 and phi 2 attain at the minimum, it determines the inverse. get from the partition function. And you know, when you get that, you get a kind of a complicated looking expression. Here's the column HD expression. And that's why I got, again, as a check, when you let the Hall ratio go to zero, this function reduces to this, which, you know, it's been worked out for MHD to rematch. So that's a sort of a validity check. But the, the key is, uh, you know, you can specify, you know, typical values for alpha, beta, and gamma, and also H, the Hall parameter, and then, you know, vary these function as a function of, vary these functions as a function of K. And what you'll find is that for uh, both Hall MHD and MHD, they turn out pretty peak at the lowest value of K. And K remembers an integer, goes from one to I cut it off at 15 because that's for a 32 cube grid system that what the maximum K will work out to. It always works out to a little less than half the size of the system. Uh, you know, it's, so it's basically I'm saying that most of the energy resides at the low mode when the system goes to equilibrium. You know, you could have the same set up a system, you know, it might be peaked sort of in the middle to start with, in the middle of the range, but after it interacts and goes to equilibrium, you'll always get most of the energy at the lowest value of K. Now, notice, except for, you do get some kind of a little of an uptick effect at high values of all MHD, but, you know, it's an effect that is there, you should be aware of, but typically, especially when you introduce things like a for real system dissipation, this sort of thing will tend to flatten out and go away. You'll still get this high, high peak energy at the low okay Here's the minimization I was talking about. plot it as a function of the two parameters, so this is supposed to be a 3D plot, it does actually contain a minimum here. And these are the typical values, you know, that I use for the starting energy, generalized solidity and magnetic solidity, and also the call ratio of third. So these, you know, at the minimum point, the phi 1 and phi 2, we get this. And once you know those, that will determine your inverse temperature. 
once you determine your inverse temperature, that gives you, you can determine all your eigenvalues. Once you know your eigenvalues, we call that one, they're inversely proportional to the energy. So I listed out the four fundamental eigenvalues for the first mode and the second mode. But the key is this one for the fourth eigenvalue for the first mode is way smaller than all the rest. In fact, it's on the order of uh, n cubed smaller than all the rest. That's what you typically going to see. So this is a this is the you know the interesting thing because this means that all the energy will go toward the lowest k and for the fourth fundamental eigenvalue. Recall this whole statistical mechanics analysis of things that uh, that the uh, ensemble average values in the end will equate to the time average values. That's the definition of ergodicity. But we've seen this from numerical simulations of plot, which hopefully will work. I'll show you an example of this. That for whatever reason that eigenmode associated with a very small eigenvalue doesn't quite average out to zero when you run the simulation for a sufficiently long time. Uh, and that basically having to do with the fact that that value is so much bigger than all the other values that have such a small eigenvalue. So, you know, from the eigen analysis equation for the eigenvariable, if you set the first three equal to zero compared to the last eigenvariable, you'll get these sorts of relations. Basically, it's just solving these couple equations. Basically, these two relations come from setting this term to zero, this term to zero. If you want this, this, to be zero. And this relationship here comes from using the results of these and putting it putting it into the second, the second and fourth set of equations. And if you look at this, this is equivalent, this is equivalent to, uh, this relation is equivalent to velocity being, you know, the same magnitude or parallel in line with vorticity. This relation is equivalent to magnetic field being parallel or in line with current density. This last relation just basically says that U is proportional or in parallel to B. And what that means is, remember those force terms in the Hall equation, that means the U cross B, the U, the U cross omega, and the U, the J cross B term, which are the nonlinear driving force terms, will all go to zero. And when that's the case, then it says that whatever you started off your fourth initial eigenvariable will last, it tends to stay there if you have no driving terms. So that's the, the rate of change is zero. So that leads to broken ergodicity in the sense that it start off at non-zero, but when you run it out long enough, it doesn't necessarily average to zero. It hovers where it starts, you know, where it starts at. So, you know, as the example before us showed, it's, ten, it's going to only happen at the lowest value of k, at k equal 1. And that's, you know, leading you to a force field free state. So let's hopefully see, I'm, I'm hoping that this will work. I'm doing on time. Okay, we'll skip that a little time. Ah, good. All right, this is a, a MATLAB simulation. I've done, you know, some of, I haven't done any actual simulations to this hall in HD yet, but I have done the, the studies for uh, the Navier Stokes situation. Um, everything I just said is identical for Navier Stokes, well, not identical, but similar, except 
kind of reversed, where you get all the energy in all MHD and, and MHD go to low phase, the other way around. You go to the high phase. Um, an example of that you can kind of see is I've done this before, maybe some people have or noticed. If you drop a little bit of food coloring into a, a glass of water and watch it, you know, go through its turbulent flow, it tends, everything tends to, to swirl and break off into smaller and smaller chunks, right? The little curls and vortices. And it'll keep getting smaller and smaller, all the little whirls, until eventually the dissipation just takes it away. So that is an example of the energy. If you're not, you know, that's a Navier Stokes situation where the energy are going to small, smaller and smaller values, or you know, sizes which apply to higher, the higher payloads. So this, this is a, a simulation for what you would see for. It's Navier Stokes, but think of this would be that what you would see imagine to that fourth item mode where everything tends to get stuck at uh, non-zero mean values. So this little circle is where it starts and when you run it, I think I ran this out, it jumped for a thousand total seconds. All right, so this is a snapshot at the, at the end. Now, if you look at for a thousand seconds, which is fairly long by by the definition, you know, of of the simulation, it, it sort of stuck around where it started from. You know, right down here is the zero value. If it really did average out to zero, it would have you know made a nice uniform blob around the origin. And this is a snapshot at the end of up to ten ten times longer at ten thousand. It does actually sort of cover the origin, but you know, not quite. It's just, you know, if you actually were to average this out, it would not quite average out to zero. Now, if you contrast that to, so that's an example of that fourth eigen mode where it doesn't average out to zero. But if you contrast that to, uh, the other three modes, essentially, You know, it'll look something like, and notice the scale. The first picture had a scale up to 40. This is a much smaller scale because these are the ones with less energy associated with, so they're not going to move about as much. When we run this, and I think this only ran for a total of 100 seconds. They started out and they moved right away to the origin. And they seem to bounce around there. So this is at the end of 10 seconds. And then this is a final snapshot at the end of 100. So right away, you know, the other one, all the way up to 10,000, didn't quite seem to average out to zero. But these, at least for these three, you know, it's fairly clear that that's centered around the origin. So. You know, this effect is seen, you know, throughout a lot of, uh, you know, turbulent systems. You always get this, after you shake it about, you always get this sort of large scale structure persisting after all the smaller scale stuff is mixed about and uh, averaged, averaged away. So, let's bring back up the presentation. So that was a simulation of broken dirt or at least for not very stoked. Hopefully in a couple months I'll get to the same point with the Hall MHD. Okay, and we're almost done. So uh, everything I've just talked about, the mathematical techniques and analysis, you can apply it to other physical systems. These aren't necessarily homogeneous. They have different geometries, but uh, like the Shevlin, I think just talked about the Earth's geodynamo. So that's the that same snapshot of uh, the 
Flashmire and Robert and Gil Reversal. Tokamak uh, uh, fusion plasma with geometry towards colloidal. So here we have spherical shells. This is the middle is a colloidal geometry. You could apply analysis to that too. Now basically anything that's uh, a nonlinear turbulent system and you have some sort of regular geometry which you can uh, apply some sort of some function expansion on. You won't necessarily use the nice Cartesian you know, exponential that I, that I use in, in my system, but you, know, you can use something equivalent. Something should exist for these. And also, uh, this might apply if you're working, you know, the early universe you know, was thought to have been within the first, I don't know, microseconds. So it's thought to be so hot that all the fundamental particles which are made of quarks was just sort of a big plasma suit. So, you know, one way to study that is to uh, apply these techniques to uh, call the quark gluon plasma. Um, you know, you can't know that any of these are reality, but they're a starting point. You know, you anything else, the problem is, you know, these systems, as defined, since they're chaotic, uh, and nonlinear really don't have any analytical solutions. So you have to assume something, put them in, and, and you know, if it matches something real, then, then you've got something. So as with the Earth's geodynamo, the simulation technique did show a field of this, so that was implying that you know, there's some reality. Okay. All right, so. So anyway, I want to just conclude. What I basically did was, as I said, presented a mathematical physics model, for ideal Hall MHD. I apply a Fourier spectral method to it so that we can think of the interacting uh, you know, Fourier mode as an ideal gas. And then we kind of apply this as an ideal glass gas, classical equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, so that come up with computed ensemble average values and we can compare that to numerical values. The numerical values by definition will be time, time average values. So in numerical then we'll be stepping forward in the time. And uh, we simplify the analysis by looking at the normal mode, which is equivalent to looking at I, you know doing forming an eigen analysis that showed us that one Eigen mode at the lowest k tends to have you know, have most of the energy that leads to a large scale structure and also it's called broken earth physicity because in that simulation it didn't seem to average up to zero even when you run it long enough. And uh, and then the final comment, you know, the tie in with real plasma is that all idealized with no dissipation would be you should still see these kind of general effects, even though it's real plasma. Because for MHD, if you recall, the energy goes to the lowest K after it equilibrates. And even with real effects of dissipation, those effects, the dissipation goes at K squared, so it's a high K mode that will be dissipated away first. So you should still have this persisting effect even with uh, Located for a real and, uh, I think that's it. One more. Oh, this is just, you know, I, I had that picture earlier of the magnetosphere, and it just was taken recently. So, this is a great picture of the aurora over Norway. And, uh, you know, there's, it's, this is clearly a, a turbulent, nonlinear system. And you know the results are, you know, are like pretty pictures for us. And yeah, and if you're interested, these are you know a lot of these I had uh, used that reference back to Shevlin's work. He had talked about similar. He talked about similar stuff last week. Uh, 
Now, in the bottom, you know, for those of you that take in classical mechanics, that, that string example was taken out of uh, the uh, classical mechanics by Salazar. So, uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next week um, is spring break, so there won't be a, a talk, but there will be a talk the following Tuesday after spring break, so that'll be uh, two weeks from tonight. Thank you. Oh, you got to switch that off.